Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Sabbath services. Thank you very much for the special music uh, from the Dallas Choir. I believe, if I understood it correctly, their first time to perform, I guess, as a choir. So we're very, very pleased, very happy to have them perform special music today. thought it was very interesting uh, sitting here listening to Mr. Hall uh, give his sermonette. Uh, I wasn't much older than Mr. Hall when I performed the wedding for his parents. And uh, so that was uh, kind of a surreal experience to sit there. Very happy that at least some of his family was able to make it here for the graduation and very appreciative for his contributions over the past year. Uh, it has indeed been a good year. We've enjoyed it very much. Uh, we've now finished our second year, which is hard to believe. And of course, today is a not only the Sabbath, but a very special opportunity to not only speak to the students, but to speak to all of you a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish here at Foundation Institute. And a very special occasion tonight, there will be a, a dinner and graduation this evening, and then uh, I guess that brings the official close to this particular year. As I said, we've had a successful year. We're very, very pleased, and we want the success to continue. Of course, the measurement of success is going to be very difficult. Uh, we know from not only many years of experience, but just simply the way it is, that the true success of Foundation Institute will not be known for years. You know, well, certainly there'll be certain successes you can know fairly soon, but we really anticipate it'll be years before we will know, you know, begin to see evidence of the success of what we've been able to do here in nine months. Really all we've been able to do is plant a seed that we hope and pray will grow. And of course, a lot of that will depend upon how fertile the soil is as each student goes his separate way or her separate way and uh, begins to get back into a, whatever routine maybe they had before coming here. So this afternoon, I'd like to address that topic in a general way, but maybe a little bit more specific as I go along. By asking the question, what picture do we, and I'm speaking uh, general terms of those who've taught this past year, what picture do we want the FI students to take home with them? You know, if you had to boil it all down into a mental picture, what would it be? Now, I, I can assure you we don't want them to take home with them the picture of Mr. Johnson standing next to his lectern where he's confined because he tends to walk too far. We actually have Mr. Johnson very confined. We have a, a roped off area, not roped off, but a taped off area that we tell him he can't go beyond. Or Dr. Levy uh, lecturing in one of his classes, or you, know, you name any of the other instructors. It's not our faces and pictures that we want them to take home with them. But we do have a picture in mind. We do have, and I'll use this term a lot this afternoon, a vision that we hope they will take with them, and I think a vision that we pray the entire church will take with it as well as time goes on. To begin with, I'd like to take you back to an experience in my life that obviously in retrospect, I didn't really understand it so much at, at that point at the age of 10, but how important a mental picture is to have in your mind in order to accomplish things in the future. I mentioned before I grew up in northeastern Arkansas, it's a pretty flat area, and we routinely, every spring, have tornadoes. And I know that's true, certainly even in this area as well. But as a child growing up, I remember it being really a, a, not only a fear, but it was also a horrible routine. And over and over again, from March through May, in the middle of the night, we were rolled out of our beds and told we had to get into the storm cellar. That was a horrible experience. We had, we lived in a, we were sharecroppers and we lived in a, an old tenant house that really had two rooms to it. We had the, the front room, which was the bedroom, living room, den, office, whatever you want to call it. And then we had a, a kitchen and a dining room, which was another room. Uh, but our home happened to be where they chose to dig the storm cellar. Now a storm cellar was simply a hole in the ground that had a top on it that was tin, was uh, tacked down, and flat as that they could get it, and then there was a door that would open up and you'd walk downstairs or a ladder to get down into this storm cellar. It was a terrible place. 
I mean, it was, there was usually water standing in the bottom. It was dirt walls, dirt floor. It smelled bad. And we would go there night after night as the storms would come. We had no weather channel. We had no way of knowing except by experience that the weather was bad enough you had to go over and over again. I always hated that. And especially when my grandfather would never come. He lived, they lived in the big house uh, maybe uh, 200 yards away from where we lived. And everybody would gather, would go into the storm cellar. But my grandfather would never come. I said, well, I want to be like Grandpa. I don't want to go either. Well, that didn't get me very far. And I ended up down in the storm cellar over and over again. But then came the day. Late in the afternoon, just before sunset. The sky became very black, and it had a green tinge to it. I'd never seen the sky look like this before. It was very sticky, very humid, and it was very, very still. And people from the farm began to gather at our home and standing on the front porch watching the clouds. And then they began to turn orange. And I'd never seen anything like that before. And then it became very dark, and then the wind began to whip up. And suddenly everybody knew that this, this wasn't going to be the typical evening where you go into the storm cellar for an hour or two, then you come back, and all it did was rain. Something else was coming. And of course, when we looked around the corner and saw my grandfather, we knew something else was coming because he was there too. And as the wind began to blow, we quickly got into the cellar at just in time, and it truly was, as is often said, the noise of a freight train. You thought you were in the middle of a track, and this noise was so loud, and it got louder, and we were almost unable to pull the door down because the winds had gotten so high, and it took several men to actually close the door. And then we heard that horrible sound of crunching metal and of wood and things hitting the top of the storm cellar. And we really knew it was bad then. And sure enough, it was over in a few minutes, but it seemed like it was a lot longer than that. And we opened the door, and there was this house that had sat there, this two-room tenant house. And the porch was gone, and the front of the house was gone, and you could, it was like you had cracked it open and you could look inside the house. And sure enough, a tornado had come right through there. It skipped around in different places as tornadoes do, and the next day we discovered that it was one of the worst tornadoes to ever hit that part of Arkansas. Uh, there were a few fatalities. I don't recall how many at that particular time. But at the age of 10, I suddenly had a picture. I suddenly knew exactly what it was like, and I never again had a problem going to the storm cellar. It was a picture that even though 50 years later, I still carry vividly in my mind. It was a picture. It was something that I saw. That one real event made the 99 false alarms all worthwhile. Never again did I complain about the smelly old cellar. I was happy it was next to where we lived. I was happy to go there when the storms came up. We didn't experience another one in the years that I lived there, but of course a lot of other people have experienced tornadoes, and they'll tell you something similar. Until you've actually seen the damage and you know what it can do, it's all sort of theory. It's all theory. It's, well, yes, I know a tornado can tear. I've seen where there are nothing but foundations left. But to have seen the picture to have seen what it was really, it was no more theory. It was reality. And it's a picture that you carry with you for the rest of your life. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. What picture do we want our students to take home with them? What picture or vision do we want you to see as well? We're at a very difficult time in the world, in world history. Exactly how much time is left or where we are is Again, it's, you can have all sorts of speculation, but it's a very difficult time. It's been a difficult time in the church. What do we see as a picture? What do we see as a vision? Where are we going? How are we going to get there? How does all this come about? What part do you play and what part do I play? 
Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. It's a well-known verse. I'm sure you've heard many messages that use, have used this verse. It says a lot. It says a lot about who we are, what we are, and what the future holds for us. Proverbs 29, verse 18. In the King James Version, it reads like this. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keeps the law, happy is he. The New King James says, where there's no revelation, the people cast off restraint. And I'll put it in a little different terminology that the verse is telling us where there is no picture for you to see, where there's nothing there for you to lock your arms around and look ahead, to see it down the road, to imagine it, to envision it, then you have to say, well, what's the purpose? What am I doing? People cast off restraint, as it says in the New King James. The ASV says this, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. Young's Living Translation says this, without a vision is a people made naked. Without a vision is a people made naked. So I ask again, what do we want from our students? What do we want from the church? And I, when I, we, I'm not talking so much about me or any particular group, but as all of us, what do we really want? What do you come to church for every Sabbath? Why do you read your Bible? Why do you pray? Why do you go and help other people? Why do you do any of these things? What do you see in your mind? What do you look forward to? What does the future hold and what do you see? It's one thing to explain the plan of God. It's quite another to see it in a picture. From the death of Jesus Christ to the final judgment on the last great day, there is a story that's told for mankind, and it's a picture. It tells us where we fit, what we must know, what we must do with our lives. We might say this is the same picture that we've tried to convey to our students over the past nine months. What picture will they take away? I can still see the tornado, or at least I can see the effects of it. I can still remember that evening. I was 10 years old, 1960. I could remember it very well, more than 50 years ago. How clearly will our students see this experience at FI, and what will it mean down the road? Christ spoke in parables partly to hide the meaning from those who certainly were not involved in his work, but he gave a clear picture to the disciples. The kingdom is like a grain of mustard seed, he said. The kingdom is like a field, he said. The kingdom is like a treasure in a field. These are all visuals that help the disciples get a clear picture of what they were truly involved with. This is a huge challenge. In the world today, you have humanity leaning more and more, at least the, you, you might say, the intellectual humanity, more and more to the idea that human beings are nothing more than a higher level of animal. That somehow this process has gone on and you've developed from a, a low life animal to a higher life to a higher life and then we have humanity. Well, it's all foolish. It's really foolish. There's a huge difference between a human being and an animal. One of the biggest differences is not only that a human being can reason and make decisions, but a human being can dream, a human being can see a picture, and a human being can plan for that based upon that dream. We're very different. God did not create us from the animal kind. God created us to follow his kind, to be a part of the God kind, to be a part of a family that is able to dream and see a vision and work toward that vision and make it happen. Nothing great has ever occurred without a dream. Nothing great has ever occurred without a vision. The kingdom of God will not come without a vision, without a picture, without an understanding and a grasp by God's people. Oh, it'll come, but for you and me to be a part of it, we must see it clearly. Now, here's where the problem comes in. And, and you could find a lot of surveys that will say something similar to this, maybe not quite exactly the same. But in the world of learning and education, these statistics seem to bear out. If you read something and a little time goes by, let's say you read a book this week, a month goes by, 
you will only have retained about 10% of what was in that book. I, I read a book, uh, oh, maybe three or four months ago, about the uh, a story about prisoners of war in, in uh, Germany who had been, these were the elite prisoners. They had been captured, they were the pilots, and they had been captured and put in a particular prison, a very elite prison in Germany. This is early in the war. Uh, these men got together, they worked it out, and they actually escaped. Ninety of them, I believe, escaped in Germany. This is in the middle of the war. Well, this went all the way to Hitler, and Hitler was so upset that they escaped from his premier prison that he gave an order that became infamous. He ordered that every one of them be tracked down, captured, and killed. And this was all, no, no one really knew about this until after the war. And at the Nuremberg trials, this actually came out and they appointed a commission or a group of investigators to go find every single German soldier that participated in killing these men. And they were to be killed themselves. They received the death penalty. And the book is about that story. Well, my wife read the book recently and she said to me, she said, oh, you remember so-and-so? I said, no, I don't remember a name. I remember the story, I read it three or four months ago, but I couldn't tell you the names of the main characters. If you read something a few weeks, a few months later, you will retain approximately 10% of it. If you are told something, you hear something explained to you, three or four months later, statistics will say that you will remember 20% of what you heard. And everyone who's spoken or given sermons, I've had people tell me, oh, you gave this great sermon, and, and you said this, this, and that. And I said, well, first of all, I wasn't even there, and secondarily, I didn't say any of that. You remember 20% of what you hear. I'll be happy if you remember 20% of what I say today. But that's just the way it is. Now, if you watch something demonstrated, someone put something together, it does an experiment, and you watch it occur, 30% of what that individual covers, you will retain three months later, 30%. Now, if you combine reading, hearing, and observation or demonstration, you can retain 50% of the information. And then if you add writing it down, the words you read it, you hear it, you watch a demonstration, and you write it down. Write down how you felt, what you understood. Three months later, you will retain 70% of that information. What does that tell us? It tells us that the key is to use as many of your senses as possible. That if you build a vision of the kingdom of God, if you build a vision of the future, it must be based upon all of the senses. It must be really a part of you not something separate from you. And we've known this for forever, that to be a true Christian, it must be who you are, not a philosophy that you carry with you. It must be who you are, because you've internalized it, you've learned it, you've read it, you've heard it, you've written it down, and you've seen it demonstrated in people's lives. Now it becomes a part of you. Spiritual matters seem to be no better when you do surveys about that as well, it seems to be no better than the way the general education works. For example, this is one of Barner's surveys, 53% of young adults ages 18 to 30 admit to reading the Bible once or less in the past year. Now, don't be misled, less than one means zero. You know, it's once or less. That means 53% probably didn't read it. In other words, your choice is, did I read it one time or less? So don't be confused. that Well, 53% of young people read the Bible at least once last year. In reality, what it's saying is that 53% did not read it at all. The question was once or less, 53%. 63% of Americans cannot name the four Gospels. 22% of professing Christians do not read the Bible at all. And, of course, you've heard some of these others before. Only two people in ten could name the presenter of the Sermon on the Mount. Barna claims that 12% of the adults in his survey believe that Noah's wife was Joan of Arc. 12%, that's, more, that's one out of eight people believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. 
He also said 50% of Americans think Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. 50% of people. Another poll that Barna conducted concluded that Billy Graham is the primary author of the Sermon on the Mount. In other words, the majority could not name or know who gave the Sermon on the Mount. D.A. Carson, in his book titled The Gagging of God, writes this about our country. In many parts of the country, we cannot assume any biblical knowledge on the part of our hearers at all. The most elementary Bible stories are completely unknown. Furthermore, the situation is getting worse. Again, D.A. Carson in the book Gagging of God came out about 10 years or so ago. People have no mental picture in their minds when they think about religion. It's pretty blank. Or there's maybe some bad information there. One of the most successful pastors in the U.S. is Joel Osteen. And he's actually very honest about it all. He preaches to 20,000 people on Sunday. He's the author of several books and written several books about success and other things. Joel Osteen, when asked what is his goal in giving a sermon, he said, my goal isn't to preach the Bible. Now, this is a paraphrase. didn't quite say those words. But essentially, that's what he said. And I've never seen any place that he denied that anywhere. That I don't, you know, he doesn't really preach the Bible because he doesn't understand it that well, but he wants people to hear a good story and to leave feeling good about themselves. The ability to teach the Bible or the desire to teach the Bible in churches today is not what it was 40 years ago. Barna also once in his survey, he said a, a fundamental shift occurred in America in the 1960s. People stopped dressing up for church and they stopped taking their Bibles to church. You could drive through any city or village or town in America in the 1960s or 50s, and you would see people walking to church on Sunday morning dressed up with their Bibles. Now, Barna's conclusion was that if church isn't important enough to dress up, if it isn't important enough to even carry your Bible, then why should we be surprised that knowledge of the Bible has decreased dramatically since the 1950s? and the desire to, to pursue religion at all. Turn with me to Mark chapter 4. Mark the fourth chapter. There's an episode that occurred in the lives of the disciples with Jesus Christ. And I bring this to your attention because if you read the Gospels, uh, certainly there is uh, theology there. Uh, there, there is doctrine there. You can lay it out. I think sometimes people get frustrated. Well, why wasn't this issue addressed in the Scripture during the time of Christ? Why wasn't, you know, and you name the issue. Uh, but a lot of the story of the Gospels is just that, stories. And you're going to see that the disciples took these stories and learned from them. And from that, then, they took the Gospel message to the world. But Mark chapter 4, verse 35 it says, on the same day when evening had come, uh, he said to them, let's cross over to the other side of the lake, or the Sea of Galilee, actually. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling, but he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? Here's a story. Here's an episode that they no doubt never forgot, any more than I always remember the tornado that we went through. But he never forgot, or they never forgot. But he used it for them to learn. He says, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? That's a, a, an interesting story, but it's just that a, a story except for the impact it had. And the fact that Christ used that, uh, was it deliberate? Was he... Uh, knew that this was going to happen, he went to sleep, he wanted them to learn that they could survive 
if, even if he weren't physically present, because he was going to be leaving them, but only if they had faith. So Jesus Christ makes it an object lesson in faith. Now look at John 21, and I think you begin to see why this is important. John 21, the very last verse of John, verse 25. says, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written about what Christ did, about these vignettes, these stories, these things that happened that built a picture for the disciples and made them driven by this message to take it to the world. They became apostles. They became teachers. They took the message to the world. I mentioned recently of coming back from India and going to uh, the, the city of Madras and, and hearing the story there, uh, you know, about the apostles coming there. And it, it's an incredible story. You read it, even in the first century, we don't know all the places they went, but they were driven by what? By a vision and a picture. They knew what they saw. I find it interesting that the next book, you'll see it just below uh, the, as you come to the first chapter of the next book, it's called the Acts. Uh, in small letters, it says the Acts of the Apostles. It's an interesting word in Greek. Uh, the Greek word for Acts is praxis, P-R-A-X-E-I-S. It means actions or works. I was embarrassed a number of years ago, I, I you know, Obviously, we all, none of us want to be considered stupid or dumb. We, you know, we all want to be considered, well, somewhat intellectual, maybe. Uh, but I attended, a, and I attended these over the years, a, a bar, not a bar where you drink, but Biblical Archaeological Review uh, is an organization, and they hold, a, a meet, every year they hold a, a convention or a conference, and they bring the, the mo most renowned scholars from around the world to make presentations. And I've attended them over the years. I attended one in Boston a number of years ago and sat next to an individual. And he, he asked me about the church, and I was telling him, he said, well, what is your praxis? And I said, what on earth is that? You know, he didn't ask me, what is your doctrine? He said, what is your praxis? And I, I thought long and hard, and I, and I, I had finally had to admit I, I had no clue what he was talking about. He said, oh, I, I know, I can read what you believe. I want to know what you do. What does your church do? What are the works of your church? Do you have missionary work? Do you have any, and he would go through a long list of things. What is your praxis? I thought it was interesting that the book of Acts we view as a history of the church. And the history of the church is told through stories. The stories of events that occurred to the apostles, primarily the apostle Paul and the apostle Peter in the book of Acts. And then you notice verse 1 of the book of Acts. Well, actually, I'd like to read. This is the prelude in the New King James Version to the book of Acts. It says, Praxis was commonly used in Greek literature to summarize the accomplishments of outstanding men. And then verse 1 says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. To do and teach. What did he do? What he did had as much impact on the apostles as what he taught. Because what he did formed a picture of who he was and what this was really all about. A picture, a vision, something to take with them. You know, one of the proofs that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, which I, I read a book a number of years ago, If Christianity Were on Trial. It was written by a lawyer who went through all the various things to prove that, that Christ was who he said he was. And one of the proofs she gave was the fact that you don't give up your life. And the facts are that of the apostles, all but one that we know of was killed, martyred in horrific ways, run through with a sword, heads cut off, uh, were uh, crucified, they were all killed. And one of her proofs was that you cannot give up your life unless you clearly see something 
in your mind and are willing to die for it. And the fact that all of the apostles were willing to do that was proof that Jesus Christ was who he said he was because they saw it. They wa you can't spend three and a half years with a phony. You couldn't spend three and a half years every day virtually with someone who was insincere. And they had a picture of Jesus Christ that allowed them or caused them to give their lives for that same cause. Again, I ask, what kind of picture do you leave here with as a student? What kind of picture do you have as a church member? Do we have the vision and do we see what Jesus Christ did and what we're being called to do? Or is it kind of a fake or a phony or is it kind of uh, an intellectual pursuit? It's something that we can show in the Bible. We can take great pleasure in going through the Bible and say, look, I can show you the Sabbath is on Saturday. Uh, I'm sure our ch some of our children could do that. That means nothing, or I shouldn't say nothing, very little, unless it's also what we do. You've probably had the same experience I've had. I've met many people over the years who told me they agreed with the Sabbath, they agreed even with the holy days, uh, but, you know, doing it was a different matter. Doing it was a different matter. If you have a clear vision, a clear picture, then doing it will be the same as seeing it, believing it. Your doctrine becomes who you are. What you, be what you believe becomes what you do. It's a picture that you have in your mind. Look at Acts chapter 4. There are many pictures of the church in the New Testament, found in the New Testament, many visuals of what the church was. One of these is found in Acts 4, verse 32. And I, I, I get a visual when I, when I look at this and I think, well, what a wonderful visual. What a wonderful visual. Acts 4, verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believe were of one heart and one soul. Now that's a visual, one heart and one soul. So then you get a picture of the church as a human body. Human body doesn't have two hearts, doesn't have two souls. It has one. And therefore, it is single in purpose and in mission and in vision. It sees the same thing. It views the same thing. It believes the same thing. It does the same thing. It's one heart and one soul. So you imagine all of the people of God around the world in this one body. That's a beautiful picture. It's not always the picture we see in reality. But it's a vision. It's what the church should be. One heart and one soul. It's an amazing picture described there of the church. How about Ephesians chapter 2? Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 19. Here's another visual of the church. Ephesians, the second chapter, in verse 19. Uh, Paul writes to the Ephesians, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now he uses the example of a building a, a, a building or a house. So you are of the household or the family of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And then he becomes even more specific in verse 21, in whom the whole building... This is a vision. This is a picture. This is the way to imagine the church in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And now catch this, verse 22. In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. The idea of being together, the idea of a community, the idea of an assembly is inherent in the meaning of the church. While there are those that may be scattered and may be alone, we don't choose to be that way because we are a community. We are a building. We are being put together. You can't be put together if you're separated or you're out you know, alone, of course, unless you have to be. There's a very important principle about meeting together, being together, that fits into this picture of the church. But we learned... Uh, this lesson or a similar lesson to this, or I, I say lessons, a number of years ago when we were living in Massachusetts and we decided to build a house. Uh, we never built a house before. We decided, well, that's a good thing to do. We'll build a house. Now, uh, it, it didn't quite happen that way, but one Sunday morning we were in our home and 
This was back in the early 1980s, and uh, we had a, heard a knock on the door, and the economy was really uh, uh, booming in uh, New England, and especially the housing market. A fellow knocked on our door, and I went to the door. There's a husband and his wife, and he says, would you like to sell your house? And I said, well, I don't know. I hadn't thought about it. He said, well, what if I give you cash? I said, well, let me go talk to my wife. Um, he said, well, is it for sale? I said, well, I, I don't know. I said, in, in principle, everything I own is for sale except my wife and kids. <laughs> and so he said, well, we, we want to buy it. I said, well, we talked about it a few minutes. I came back. I said, okay, but give us a little while to figure out what we're going to do. Where are we going to live? So we had this great idea. We were going to build a house. How do you build a house? Well, I didn't know. So I said, well, I'm going to be the contractor. What does that mean? I don't know, but that's what I'm going to be. So I went to the... I don't know, some, some little store, and I bought graph paper. And I said, you know, it's graph paper. It's, it, you can, each one of these little squares equals so many feet, and you can draw it out. So I took the graph paper, and we began drawing. We began looking at pictures of houses, trying to get into our minds what we wanted to build. We looked at hundreds and hundreds of houses and found nothing that we really liked. So I got out my graph paper. I drew it out. I drew the really crudely, but I drew the, what the front would look like and how wide it would be and I drew the side and I drew the back and I drew the other side and we had a piece of property we'd bought that had a slope so it'd have a walkout have a basement and two floors and so now what do we do well you have to find out if you can get money to build it so okay we have a we're in a little bitty community in Massachusetts a little town called Uxbridge that was probably the same as it had been since the 1700s everything in the little town worked on trust and everybody knowing everyone so the little bank, I think the name of the bank was Uxbridge Savings, just a little bank. So I said, I'll go in and ask them. I set up an appointment, went in and talked to the uh, individual, I believe he was the bank president, and he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to build a house. He said, okay, that's fine. He said, who will be the contractor? I said, I will. He said, well, okay, that's fine. And he said, well, do you have anything to show me of the house? And I pulled out my graph paper, and I gave him several sheets of graph paper. He looked them over, and he says, this is what you have? And I said, yes. And he said, well, he said, you know, we're a small town bank. He said, uh, how much money do you need? I gave him a figure. He said, okay. He said, you can have it. And he said, we'll give you a loan. And he said, we're, we're going to shake hands on it. I said, well, don't I need to sign anything? He said, no, we trust you. You don't have to sign anything. He said, but now when you get everything ready to go, I said, this is the percentage, this is the rate you'll pay. And he said, when you get everything ready, come back and we'll sign some documents. And on a handshake, he gave us the approval to build a house for the first time ever. Now that was a huge undertaking and quite an experience. I came back later on and we signed a few documents and you know we, we bought a house here two years ago and I think we signed a hundred pieces of paper. I, I was actually looking for the final piece of paper that said this paper verifies that neither one of us trusts each other for anything. I don't know, it might have been there, I don't know if it was there or not, but it seemed that way. And yet, you know, 30 years ago, we, we actually got a loan to build a house on a handshake. And then we built the house. But we had a picture. We had it in our minds, what we wanted, and we couldn't find anything that was just like it. But we knew what it should look like. In Revelation 19, the church is compared to a bride which is another visual that everybody can get. You can see that. It's like a bride in a wedding, and we've been to weddings. We know what that looks like. Revelation 19, verse 7, it talks about the church, this woman who's marrying Jesus Christ. If you can only imagine in your mind that you are and that we all are a bride waiting to be married to Jesus Christ, I believe if that vision is clear in your mind, then it will change the way you act. Just as a young woman preparing to be a bride or being a, becoming a bride is going to look at things differently than she did before. That vision. Robert Fritz, an author, wrote this. He says, it is not what a vision is, it's what a vision does. If a vision doesn't affect the way you live your life, then it's of little value. A nice story is just that, a nice story. 
But knowledge of God's way of life is more than a nice story. It is real, it is true, and it will change your life. This really should be the lesson and the picture taken from Foundation Institute. And really for all of us as Christians today, that if you see the vision, if you know what it's about, then it cannot help but change your life. Well, let's analyze this a little further. Let's define this word vision. I, I want to be clear. I, I don't want it to be, you know, you can talk about vision a lot. It can be really kind of ambiguous. I'd like to be a little more clear. You can't define every single facet, but I want to be a little, I want to bring a little more clarity. The definition of vision, there are three primary definitions. One is simply eyesight. You know, being able to see, that's your vision. You, you go and have your vision checked. Number two is a mental picture or an image or a concept that's in your imagination. That's vision. The third one is something seen in a dream. Something seen in a dream. So those are the three primary definitions of vision. I'm talking about this mental picture. I'm talking about what you see in your mind when you think of the church. When you think of your year here at Foundation Institute, what picture is there? What will you take with you and what will it do for your life? If it's that clear vision and clear image, it doesn't mean you won't stumble or, or have difficulty in life, but that vision will drive you on. At some point in your life, you'll make the decision based upon that vision whether you're really going to stick with this or not. You know, at some point, you cross over that boundary where you say, look, you know, this is it for the rest of my life. I'm not going anywhere or doing anything. I, this is it for the rest of my life. This is what I believe. This is who I am. And this is what I'm going to do. The vision drives that. So what, what, is, what does this term vision do for you? What, is it, what does it change about you? Let me give you a few things that vision should do for you. Again, I'm talking about this vision. Uh, first of all, vision, by definition, sees what others cannot see. Vision in the church of God should help you see things that others cannot see. That's not something weird or strange or odd. You must know by now that people in the world don't see things the way you do. But that's the way it should be. That's The vision is to see things that others cannot see. Helen Keller was asked if there was anything worse than being blind. Her comment was, having eyesight but no vision is worse than being blind. Walt Disney claimed that he could see what Disney World would look like before they ever took the first shovel of dirt. The story goes that after his death, uh, someone was uh, making the comment that, well, they wished he had been alive to see what Disney World became like in Orlando. And the comment was, he already saw it. That's why it's here. He had already seen it. George Bernard Shaw said, you see things and you say, why? But I dream of things that never were, and I say, why not? Vision, dream. Hebrews 11, verse 13. Hebrews 11, it, we, we generally, and I, not that that's wrong, but we generally declare Hebrews 11 to be about faith. Hebrews 11 is a series of stories of faithful people. But what was it that made them so different? Look at verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They saw. That's why they had faith. They could see. They had a vision. They had a picture. They could see the future. I don't know how much they saw. I mean, could they see what things are like today? Could they see what the future held? I don't know that they saw that, but I think they saw that this eternal truth would be there when it was all said and done. When the whole world blows up, when everything is gone, this truth will still be there. The family of God will still be there. Will be there. They could see that. They could see it. I find one of the more profound scriptures in the Bible is found in John chapter 8, verse 56. And you may wonder, well, what, what is this verse all about? John 8, verse 56. John, the eighth chapter, Jesus Christ has one of his major confrontations with the Pharisees. And he really condemns them, and they, and they condemn him. They say, well, you know, we're not children of fornication. We weren't born out of wedlock. 
you know, in insinuating that Christ was. We're not like you. We're better than you. And Christ came right back at them and told them that he had dealt with Abraham. And they said, how could that be? You know, you're not 30 years old or whatever. But Abraham, or you're not, I think they said you're not 50 years old or you know, whatever the figure might be. But said, Abraham's been dead for a long time. But verse 56, John 8. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. What did Abraham know about the Messiah? What did Abraham know about God's plan? We simply don't know. He walked and talked with the one who became Jesus Christ. I don't think Jesus Christ was any different when he walked the earth with Abraham than when he walked the earth with the disciples. The message is the same. The future is the same. And Abraham could see it through him. He says, he rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. You must never underestimate the value of a clear vision toward the, and what it does to change your life. Secondarily, vision believes what others do not believe. Vision believes what others do not believe. A famous author from the first part of the last century, A.W. Tozer, wrote, God is looking for those through whom he can do the impossible. What a real pity it is that we settle only for those things we can do ourselves. Vision is the capacity to step beyond our limitations and into God's ability. Vision believes what others do not believe. Thirdly, vision will create change. Vision will create change. Job 42, verse 5. One of the greatest changes and adjustments that we find a human being making is found in the book of Job. Book of Job. We have the story of Job, and we come to the end of the book. And notice the way he frames it. Job 42, verse 5. He says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. A profound and powerful change in his life came about because he could see something that he had not seen before. Vision creates change. Fourthly, vision will teach us things that are new. If you know clearly your destination, you know where you're going, you know what the future holds ultimately for all of us. If that's clear in your mind, then along the way you have the opportunity to see things that you might have missed. It's like a journey. You know you're going to this particular location, so that's, that's not even a doubt. So now because you know where you're going, you can begin to look along the side of the road and you begin to see scenery and things along the way that you would not have seen otherwise. You're not just in that sense, focused on just getting there, you want to see what the ride is like along the way. Once the vision of the future is clear, then you can begin to learn new things. You can begin to see things and experience them in a way that maybe you would not have experienced before. You know, there, there's something about certainly fearing God. Uh, we know that's true and biblical. Uh, there's also a little bit of fear in us probably about what could happen down the road. But if fear drives us so much that we fail to see what's around us, that we fail to see what life is about, then we've missed a lot. We've missed a lot. This life is a journey, and that, this journey will all too soon be over. What is going on around you? What are you seeing on the journey? What are you doing on the journey? The ultimate goal is there. We can all repeat over and over again the kingdom of God. We pray for the kingdom to come. We pray for this world to be over and for that kingdom to be here. But what's going on in this journey? If our future is sure, we know where that is, then why not look around? See, what are we doing now? What's going on today? What will go on next week? What will happen after that? And how important is that? And then number five, vision inspires you and me to greater heights doing things that we never thought we could do. John Stuart Mill once said, one person with a dream is equal to a force of 99 who have only an interest. One person with a dream 
is equal to 99 who only have an interest. To see your vision become reality, you must always do three things. See it clearly, say it continually, and show it creatively. This is one of our biggest challenges with preaching the gospel. The gospel message is set. We don't have to reinvent the gospel, but how to present it creatively so that we'll have the greatest impact on people is a challenge. It's always been a bit of a challenge, but it's even a greater challenge today. It's amazing. It's like certainly Satan knows it very well that just as an opportunity to take the gospel to the entire world, you know, via the internet, certainly, that just when that becomes available, Satan has done his greatest damage to society. So that people, no matter how compelling the message may be, seem totally uninterested in anything about religion. So it's almost as though as you see the world coming to the point where worldwide communication is entirely possible, the entire world turns a deaf ear to religion, to God, and to Jesus Christ. It isn't going to be easy. It's a great challenge. It's something we try to do and continue to try. But it is a big, big challenge challenge. Most of you in this room have probably never heard the name Benjamin Zander. Benjamin Zander is the 75-year-old conductor of the Boston Philharmonic. He's also one of the most sought-after speakers in the world, motivational speakers. He does several presentations or has done them on TED, if you're familiar with what TED is. His mission in life is to get people to appreciate classical music as you can imagine. He states that 3% of the world enjoy classical music. Now, again, I don't know where that number comes from, but only 3% of the world enjoys classical music. His mission, he says, is to only get 1% more to appreciate classical music, and he will change the world. He will change the world. Now, think about this. Now, first of all, that sounds pretty ridiculous. 1%. There are seven and a half billion people on this earth. If 1% did anything, that's 75 million people. 75 million people could certainly change the world from a, a human perspective. But how does Xander do it? What is his, how does he handle it? Well, in his presentations, he alternates between playing pieces of classical music and speaking. He's a very animated speaker. But his, he, he comes to one particular point in his presentation. He says, now this is how I'm going to do it. He says, I want every one of you to either momentarily close your eyes, but I want you to think about the, most, uh, the person you love most in this world or the person you enjoy most spending time with in this world. I want you to imagine their face in your mind. And then he said, I want you to listen to this piece of classical music. And he plays this beautiful music. There are about 1,600 people in the audience. And he's already set them up by saying, about a third of you like classical music. That's why you're here. About a third of you really don't care. You, you, know, you wanted to see a good speaker. And about a third of you don't like it at all. Don't care. And he said, but I'm going to change that. And so through his visualization, when he's finished with this piece of music, the entire audience, 1,500 or whatever, stands up and applauds. And he begins applauding them, or applauding back. And he says, well, you know, just to explain, I'm applauding you. I'm not applauding me. But he said, I know you got it. So you know how I know you got it? Because I see the light in your eyes. So when you see the light in your eyes, you know you understood it. And you know you got it. And that, that's his goal. That's his method. The idea of having you equate classical music with someone you love and someone you want to spend time with. And he's been extremely successful wherever he goes. Here's a quote from Xander. It says, it is one of the characteristics of a leader that he not doubt for one moment the capacity of the people he is leading to realize whatever he is dreaming. Not to doubt for a single moment. We, we've all heard of and we all know of the famous message by Martin Luther King Jr. You know, I have a dream. If you dig a little deeper in, in uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s material, he actually wrote what I thought was even a, a much more poignant piece 
uh, entitled A Letter from a Birmingham Jail. And in that letter, he talks about this dream that he has. Now, Martin Luther King Jr. was not the first one to object to inequality, but he caught on. Why did he catch on? Because he put it in terms and words that everybody understood. You know what he said? In his uh, letter from a Birmingham jail, he wrote, he said, I, I dream of the day when my three children can go to Fun Town. Now, Fun Town was a, a brand new amusement park in Atlanta, Georgia. That would be equivalent to Six Flags today. And he says, when my three children can go there, because he said, now they cannot go. Now, immediately an image of his three children trying to go to the amusement park and ride on the roller coasters and all the rides and being denied becomes a picture. And no matter how calloused or how, what your feelings may have been, you could see that that was not equality. It would be like today declaring that, you know, six flags over Texas, that no one Hispanic or no one black can go there. The picture makes the point. And so he describes it there. That was the dream. That was the dream. You know, a number of years ago, my wife and I visited with uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Burke McNair when, when he was retiring. We went by to visit with them. And he had a lot of old pictures from the 50s at Ambassador College, and he wanted us to see them. And he wanted to talk about that. And I, I really wish then, and I still hope that he would write some of his material up of his memoirs of the 50s at Ambassador College. And his wife, uh, Billy Sue, described her first day at Ambassador College. She said that, you know, she was a high school, graduated from high school in South Texas. Knew nothing about the church, knew nothing about the college. Her father wanted her to go. She agreed to do what her father said. Got on a bus, I believe, and went to Pasadena to go to college. And Mr. and Mrs. Armstrong picked her up at the bus station. And she sat between, Mr. Armstrong was driving, Mrs. Armstrong was on this side. And along the way, she thought she was just making small talk, knew nothing about the church, knew nothing about the college. She says, oh, and says, what kind of football team do you have? Well, Ambassador College had about 25 students at that time. And she said, well, Mr. Armstrong kind of coughed and looked over at his wife and looked back at her and said, well, we really don't have a football team. And, well, what about, and she goes through, there is no baseball team, there is no, we don't have any of that. And she said, oh, this is Ambassador College. And so we asked Mr. McNair, I asked him, I said, well, what kept you motivated when there was no, were only 20 students or so? And that was all. He said, well, Mr. Armstrong taught every single Bible class, and Mr. Armstrong took every assembly. And he said, when you walked out of an assembly or you walked out of a class, you had the feeling that this was the greatest work on the face of the earth, even though there may have only been 20 people in college. There were only 50 people at the Feast of Tabernacles earlier in, in the late 40s. It was going to be the greatest work the world had ever seen. There was a dream, there was a vision, there was something that he was seeing. The scriptures actually tell us what our vision should be. I don't think that there's any doubt. I won't necessarily go to those scriptures, but Matthew 24, 14 and Matthew 28, verse 19 tell us the vision of the church. Uh, we must envision the whole world hearing the gospel. Not just a portion of the world, the whole world. How will that happen? The how is very difficult. The vision must be there. And then secondarily in Matthew 28, verse 19, not secondarily in, in significance, but we must, it says, make disciples, care for those disciples. God has to call, but we have a responsibility in making, the, in, in making those disciples, and we also have a responsibility in caring for those disciples. Because the church is a very significant part of God's plan, and it has to become what God wants it to be. Our vision, what we're doing, how do we get there, what, what's along the road? Matthew 16, verse 18 says that Christ will build the church. It's being built even though we can't always see it or understand it. It is being built and will continue to be built until Christ returns. We have a vision, we have a mission, we have a challenge. And the pictures we should take with us from a year of, at Foundation Institute, from as a Christian going home every Sabbath, should be one of excitement, enthusiasm, and focused attention on changing our lives because of that vision. 
of what we see in our lives. It won't happen because we want it to happen. It'll happen because God works in us. Zechariah 4, verse 6. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by the Spirit of God. If we ever minimize the power of God's Spirit and pretend it's us, then we'll never get anywhere. And that vision will fade like a puff of smoke. We must be in it for the long haul. Our students this past year learned a lot of Bible knowledge. Knowledge alone is just a good story. Knowledge plus vision is life-changing. It'll change your life. Benjamin Zander told a very simple story in his TED presentation to illustrate the importance of a vision in changing your life. He told of two children being sent to Auschwitz death camp. They were two Jewish brother and sister. The sister was 10 years old and the brother was eight years old. And they were in the boxcar and later on as this, uh, the 10 year old uh, is telling this story much later in life. So she and her brother were in this boxcar headed into Auschwitz. They didn't know what lay ahead, they didn't know what was coming. So as any 10 year old sister, she looked down at her little brother, eight years old, and saw that he had no shoes on. She scolded him and saying, look at you, you can't even take care of yourself. Where are your shoes? That time the box car opens and everybody's divided and sent to different places. A few years later, she's rescued and uh, escaped, or not escaped, but is rescued from that horrible, horrible death camp. And she lives. Her brother did not. Her parents did not. And she tells a story later on as she becomes successful in life that she said that when she left there as a teenager, she had a picture in her mind of her eight-year-old brother because that was the last time she ever saw him. And she said, it was the last time I ever spoke to him. She said, I made a vow at that point in time that throughout my life I would never, never, never end a conversation negative or judgmental because you don't know if it'll be the last time you'll ever speak to that person. It changed her life. She became a, a different person. I'm sure she wasn't perfect with it, but that picture that she took with her for the rest of her life made her a different person. Learning to treat everyone in a positive way and always, always ending a discussion with something positive. Asking yourself, what would I say if I knew I would never speak to this person again? What will he or she remember about me? I encourage each of our students to go forward committing, committed to passing on the knowledge they've gained in the past year. But above all, I encourage each of us to take from here a clear vision of Christianity. We know what it is. We know what it looks like. What God expects of us where we fit in his plan and what he expects us to do with the knowledge he has given us and the vision. Knowledge without vision is just a nice story. Knowledge plus vision is life-changing. See yourself as a Christian and act like a Christian. Here's a quote from an anonymous source that I think says it very clearly. Dissatisfaction and discouragement are not caused by the absence of things, but the absence of vision dissatisfaction and discouragement are not caused by the absence of things, but by the absence of vision. See yourself as a Christian. Act like a Christian. If you do, then your year has been very successful. And I congratulate all of you on a job well done.